The Chargers can be happy having a new coach, but their offseason could still be a hot mess. We'll explain. The Dodgers start tinkering with their bullpen, and we now have three good hints that Chip Kelly will stay with UCLA football. Good morning. I'm James. This is your daily dose of sports and Stark for the greatest sports city in the world, Los Angeles. This is the Faithful Angelino's Morning Report. So it is February 6, 2024. I am back home with the wife. We did husband and wife things last night. I'm much more content. But let's not get into the details of that because what we do have are a lot of details about LA sports. And if you like being in the know about LA, quickly clack the like button, quickly clack the subscribe button. There's a notification bell. Hit that and let you know when we drop new content. Sharing is caring. Let people know we exist. And by all means, comment. It's a beautiful thing. And what else is a beautiful thing is the scoreboard because both LA NBA teams are over 500 finally. For example, Anthony Davis recorded a triple-double with 26 points, 15 rebounds, and 11 assists. Now, it might not sound like much, but after the Lakers beat Charlotte 124 to 118, they are on a three-game losing streak. And the Lakers come home with their first winning road trip of the season. Meanwhile, Kawhi Leonard scored 36 points, nobody played any defense, and the Clippers won their fourth consecutive game. Clippers 149, Atlanta 144. Meanwhile, today, nothing. This would be a lovely day to drink heavily after work, wouldn't you say? Meanwhile, try not to get a DUI. Uh, the Athletic, I must tell you, has a very thorough beat writer covering the Chargers. And with his reportage, we can get an idea of what the Bolts are up against this offseason. For example, ESPN suggested that the Chargers will be about $27 million over the salary cap this offseason. The Athletic, which used OverTheCap.com as a guide, believes it to be twice as bad. Now, you factor in that you have to have a cushion to sign your upcoming draft picks. It's not whether or not they're over the cap now, which they are by a mile, you actually have to do more than just get to zero. So you add the money that you need to use for your draft picks, plus the money that they're over the cap now, they estimate it to be about $55 million, not $27 million as ESPN reported, $55 million. Now, we talked last week because this is going to obviously lead to very tough choices for the Chargers to become cap compliant. To recap, one was literally going scorched roster. You've heard of scorched earth. We we're talking about literally dousing about a dozen uniforms with gasoline, hitting a match and saying to hell with it. Okay. For example, going scorch roster would be cutting Mike Williams, cutting Keenan Allen, Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack. Voila! The other, though, the other extreme, was to basically restructure everybody's contracts until everyone pretty much makes minimum wage. Voila! So obviously the charges are going to have to seek a middle ground, because neither one is particularly palatable. Here is what you should know, because we can go into all these kinds of hypotheticals. We're going to start off by giving you the ground floor of what the chargers have and what they're up against. And then we'll have to see how the cards play out. The Chargers, for example, have 27 free agents. 27. Considering the salary cap hole, you could expect almost all of them to go. In other words, Austin Eckler, poof, gone. Did you like tight end Gerald Everett? Poof, gone. On defense, Kenneth Murray, Michael Davis, Alohi Gilman, poof, poof, all of them, gone, gone, gone. The only free agent that you should expect to return, expect to return, would be kicker Cameron Dicker. Let's be real, kickers don't exactly break the bank. The second thing that you should know, they have eight draft picks. You're like, wait a minute, that means they have two in a round, don't they? Yes, you're right, but they're in round seven. Ick. So unless they trade down, unless the Chargers trade down, they will hold, though, three of the top 69 picks. So theoretically, <clears throat> 
the the uh, the ru the rudimentary cutoff is the top 100 picks are supposedly quality. Chargers will have at least three. If they trade down, say for example, their first round pick, you could imagine them getting even more. So there is a possibility that they could at least fill some of the holes. Three, the next big question is, can the Chargers create enough space to reward left tackle Rashawn Slater with an extension? Now he's not in the final year of his contract. Okay, let's not go there yet. He's not about to be a free agent but you can save money in the future by extending him now. So it's not exactly the biggest priority for the Chargers, but if they can figure it out, it would sure be nice. You'd like to make sure that Justin Herbert has protection for the majority of his career. Fourth thing that you should know, since we do not know for sure who will get cut to get under the salary cap, we only know about free agents who can go free agenting. What we will tell you is that the Chargers are going to have gaping holes across the roster very quickly. Very quickly. For example, Quinton Johnston really struggled as a rookie. Could he really rise that fast to being the number two receiver if Allen and or Williams get clipped? What about edge rusher if Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa are gone? You know you have Tui Tuli Pelotu. But who do you match him up with on the other side? You could imagine the Chargers, for example, and this is really crazy, replacing every running back. You could imagine the Chargers replacing every tight end. You don't even have to smoke that much blunts, that many blunts, to imagine them getting rid of and replacing all of their linebackers. So there's going to be a lot of turmoil with the Chargers this offseason. We'll have to find out how crazy it actually gets. Meanwhile, Marcus Brady left the Philadelphia Eagles. He is coming to LA to become the Chargers passing game coordinator. So at least in terms of the coaching staff, starting to get some sort of clarity as to what's going on. The Dodgers have started to cobble together a bullpen. They have brought one pitcher back and they have sent another one across the country. Basically, both pitchers had the same job. There was a little bit of redundancy. So they re-signed Ryan Brazier to a two-year deal. Then they trade reliever Caleb Ferguson to the Yankees. The two pitchers, again, they're swapping roles. Same role in the bullpen. Now, Brazier was interesting in the sense that he was salvaged from the sewage plant known as Boston. And basically, they signed him to a minor league deal. You've heard this story before about Dodger pitchers that get signed from nowhere. They teach him a new pitch. In his case, they taught him how to pitch a cut fastball and bang, all of a sudden he's lights out. Now as for Ferguson, he goes to New York in exchange for left-hander Matt Gage and prospect Christian Zazueta. UCLA football has hired three assistant coaches. Now before we get into the who and what positions they teach, I want to revisit why these hires matter because it is a little goofy, but those three hires are reasons that I believe that all the rumors that you're hearing about Chip Kelly, I don't think he's leaving now. I really don't. Rethinking whether Kelly wanted to stay with UCLA started to become a pretty decent question. There were rumors reported by scribes, albeit scribes I don't really trust, that claimed Kelly wanted to bolt the Bruins to get an offensive coordinator gig in the NFL. Now, if you go back and you check the receipts, I was like, this story doesn't really add up to me. Why would you leave being a head coach in a city where that seems to fit your personality and then go all the way across and stand hip deep in the snow calling plays for somebody else? So I was skeptical. But the counter argument was that so many people thought he was doing such a half-assed job, which by the way, is not an unfair claim. So many people thought he was doing such a half-assed job that people were like, maybe the pressure is being turned up enough on UCLA and Kelly to where Kelly throws up his hands and says, to hell with this, I can get a job somewhere else. And then of course, what happened to bolster those rumors? You look at the coaching staff and then you notice that since the season ended, Kelly let eight people move on to other gigs. Eight coaches left. 
And so while I was thinking that Kelly would prefer to stay in Westwood, you could make the argument that Kelly just wanted out because he was letting the infrastructure of the team go completely to hell. Well, the two jobs that were allegedly uh, desired by Kelly, Las Vegas and Washington, they were filled. So Kelly goes out and he hires Cody Whitfield as a special teams coordinator, Jerry Neuheisel for the wide receivers, and Tim Drevno for the offensive line. So in other words, maybe Kelly was looking elsewhere, maybe, but he's starting to rebuild the infrastructure of the team. So there is that. Here is a shocker, guys. With the fake trade rumor list of damn near 20 names, you can see it in the second column on the whiteboard, CBSSports.com says that the Lakers are the team most under the pressure cooker to make a trade this week. Yes, not just in the pressure cooker, but underneath it. Standing in the flames is Rob Palenka. Oh my God, you must make a trade. Thanks for the intel, guys. We knew. We totally knew. Meanwhile, ESPN is reporting that whatever deals the Lakers might make will not be for a third big money player unless they are all NBA quality. In other words, can the Lakers rip off another team? According to The Athletic, the only asset, and by the way, I know I'm telling you guys things that you already know. Let's make that clear. I know I'm telling you things you already know because we've been talking about this since December. The only asset teams value is still just Austin Reeves. So you put that all together. I told you about what ESPN thinks. I told you about what CBSSports.com thinks and The Athletic. You put it all together and the, the point is, is that if the Lakers do anything eye-opening, if they do anything eye-opening before the trade deadline, it's going to be Reeves plus other players for a draft pick or a draft pick for an all-star. If it's not that, it's going to be a scrub for D'Angelo Russell, and I don't see that happening. As for the Clippers, P.J. Tucker is not keeping it a secret anymore. And by secret, I mean he actually said the words, I am actively trying to get traded. No kidding. Something else we've been talking about for a couple of months. We're thorough here at Faithful Angelinos. Tucker has not played since November 29th. Now, to his credit, he has not been a total jerk about it. He simply wants to play. And the Clippers, if you really want my opinion, they should have traded him away the moment he got him or cut him. They knew they wanted James Harden. So they took on Tucker as a way to make the salaries match in the trade. Fine, totally makes sense. But the dude is a respected veteran. If you think about what you should do when you acquire players that you do not want, think about what the Utah Jazz did when they acquired Russell Westbrook from the Lakers. They said, hey, you're not playing for us. We're either gonna find a team for you or we're gonna let you be a free agent. That's how Russell Westbrook wound up being on the Clippers. But the Clippers didn't show P.J. Tucker that same level of respect. Sucks for him. When the LA Kings fired coach Todd McClellan last week, we were talking about how it was unlikely they were going to abandon the system that McClellan installed, particularly the 1-3-1 one, one defensive alignment that uh, when the Kings were awake, was extremely effective. It was effective at locking opponents up in the neutral zone. So interim coach Jim Hiller needed a right-hand man, his own top assistant. But the incoming DJ Smith's role as Hiller's right-hand man is not to reinvent the Kings strategically. This is according to the Hockey News. Smith is said to excel in communication and commitment to team loyalty which is what the Kings sorely have been lacking for the last month and a half. So we'll see if it works. Smith and Hiller are longtime associates. They both played as teammates for the Toronto Maple Leafs, or as my ex-wife liked to call them, the Maple Leaves. Meanwhile, GM Rob Blake faced the press for the first time since purging McClellan and said he was not pressured by upper management to fire the coach. 
He also added that he did not look outside the organization for McClellan's replacement. He also told the LA Times, quote, I fully understand the repercussions if this team does not win or have success, unquote. In other words, I get it, I'm next. Because you might not like the way that Blake has built the roster, but he's not oblivious to that either. For example, he did not use that interview time to blast the expensive addition of Pierre-Luc Dubois, because if he did so, that would be a tacit admission that Blake screwed up. Now, by the way, final thing, if it matters, former uh, WNBA MVP Neka Ogumake followed through on her promise to leave the Sparks in free agency. She signed with Seattle. Thanks for the memories or something. What am I going to tell you? But you let me know what you think of the comments thread. What do you think the Chargers' best plan for roster development is in the offseason? Are you cool with the Dodgers trimming the edges around the bullpen? And if you enjoyed the content, don't forget to subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. We're talking LA sports every single day now. Thank you for watching. I'm James, and we'll be back tomorrow. Faithful Angelinos is a Kian Corte El Queso production. Take care.